All right, we're going to move on now to the 311 system from the city of Chicago uh, with Theodore O'Keefe and Debbie Cacavalli. Gets right, is that right, Debbie? Close. <laughs> how, about, how about helping us get it right? Let's. I'm Debbie Cacavalli, and I'm the project manager for the implementation of the city services system within Chicago. And with me this morning is Ted O'Keefe, director of 311 City Services. <laughs> Good morning. On Thursday, August 9th, 2001, at about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, Mr. Stanley Livingston from Sacramento, California, called the city of Chicago. He was aware that we were in the middle of a particularly oppressive heat wave and concerned about an 80-year-old relative living in the city. He'd been calling her for about five days with no response. So he asked one of our 311 operators if the city could check to see how she was doing. The next afternoon, when Mr. Livingston called back, to see what we had found out, I assured him that the city's Department of Human Services had dispatched a team to her house the night before and that they found out in conversation with the neighbors that his relative, Ms. Johnson, had planned to be out of town for five days. He asked if I could give him my direct number so that in case he was unable to contact her after Saturday, uh, he could find out more from me about what we discovered. Fortunately, Ms. Johnson was okay. This is one example which I hope illustrates the dividend Chicago has received as a return on our investment in a comprehensive, customer-driven 311 system that gives local residents and indeed people from around the country easy access to the programs and services our local government offers. All of us are aware that understanding complex bureaucracies and navigating the labyrinth-like corridors of government all too often frustrates people and exacerbates the cynicism they feel toward government agencies. However, by implementing 311 and the 311 system as a one-stop shopping center, Chicagoans can now call 311 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to request city services, check on the status of previously requested services, obtain information about programs and services offered by the city, and file non-emergency police reports. No clout, no referrals, no special connections needed. For us, this process began in 1997. We took a hard look at the way residents requested services and how our departments responded, and we realized we had room for improvement. Within a year and a half, 311 was up and running with a modern PC-based system that has improved communication among departments, reduced response time to residents' requests, and generated management reports that ensure a more efficient service delivery system for the city of Chicago. Today, as evidenced by the growth in call volume to 311, more than 3.6 million calls placed last year, and the number of services tracked in our system, more than 1.9 million services last year, 311 has become one of the tools most frequently used by residents and city workers committed to build, building a better Chicago. Early skeptics and reluctant bureaucrats have been turned around. Ownership by a broad range of stakeholders continues to increase day by day, because it works. Let me cite three ways in which it works. First, the system is completely transparent and as such fosters accountability. The system is used by the mayor's office and the budget office to allocate resources. Information is gathered by local aldermen to see the number and types of services being delivered to their constituents in their respective wards. Every district commander in the Chicago Police Department has access to updates on how other city departments are addressing chronic disorder problems such as abandoned cars and graffiti on each and every beat in the city of Chicago. Second, it's enabled us to establish benchmarks. If you had asked us in 1998, how long does it take to get graffiti down? Our answer probably would have been about a week or so. If you had asked us at the beginning of this year, we would have said, Last year, on average, 4.6 days, and that's down from 7.7 .7 days the year before. Similar benchmarks are now being put in place for city workers, such as sewer crews and field investigators. Finally, access to timely information, such as that sought by Mr. Livingston, and real-time information required by city public health officials about reports of dead blue jays and dead crows that preceded the outbreak of the West Nile virus would not have been possible had we not upgraded our system. We believe that this has helped us to deliver basic municipal services to the three million residents of Chicago more efficiently. 
And we believe that the 311 system has the potential to help other jurisdictions accomplish the same results. For that reason, we've already made a commitment to provide training and technical assistance to cities as large as New York City and uh, Los Angeles, California, and as small as Rockford, Illinois, and Springfield, Ohio. We look forward to continuing to work with you and other cities committed to developing a quality customer service system for their people. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Yes, Susan Schwab. I'm interested in how you go about training the folks on the other end of the phone. Um, clearly, the impact that your 311 operators have uh, are the, basically the be-all and end-all of how successful your system is going to be. And, and how do you maintain that quality? How do you make sure that this isn't just a referral to a referral to a referral, which is what most citizens expect when they call their governments? Well, we at the call center, we, we have a goal. Uh, obviously, when, when the call comes in and it's about a uh, filing a non-emergency police report in the Chicago Police Department, 22% of the Chicago Police Department's case reports are produced right at the 311 center by sworn officers. So our, our operators who receive those calls obviously give those to the uh, uh, police officers so that they can answer those calls and file those reports. But on other calls, we'd like to accomplish a 90% first call resolution rate. And the, the demand on us for training is absolutely incredible. To stay in touch with departments, to understand their programs and their policies, changes in the way that they do the work uh, is something that we face on a daily basis. Uh, can I, can I uh, just, just walk us through this briefly? If someone calls 311, how long are, does it take before they hear a human voice? It depends on what time of the day you call or what uh, day of the week you call if we're in the yeah. middle of a, a heat crisis. But on average, I believe the, uh, the average speed of answer for last month, we had 297,000 calls placed to 311 in the city, and the average answering speed was 13 seconds. 13 seconds for a human voice to be on the other end of the line. Yeah, we have, uh, unless there's an extraordinarily long queue, we have no front-end IVR system. Our mayor believes that when people call the government, they should talk to someone who works for the city. That's your mayor's view? Absolutely. Uh -huh. And then once you get somebody on the line, do they, the they have really a... says he wants something to happen, most of us hop to it. Uh, he, uh, he won an award here once before. <laughs> he, he made that very clear to us. <laughs> the, uh, but once they get somebody on the line, does that person have a computer in front of them and they then are in touch with an agency? What happens next? Okay, the call comes in, the operator answers the call. The operator has the, the directions for each type of service request, and we got about 550 service requests in the system today. Right. They actually put in all the information. The minute the information is put into the system, the department on the other end, he has access to it. So it's a full, true work order system. So from the point in time that call comes in through final resolution of the issue, we track it through our city services system. And so it's not back just the calls coming in. It's the back end. It's the workflow. It's, it's whether inspectors get assigned. It's tracking the work crews through final final resolution of the problem. And does and on the, does a citizen then know, is there a, a call back of any sort? Or? The citizen actually gets a service request number. They can call back and they can um, actually. Like, like tracing your luggage it. kind of thing. Right. You sound more efficient than the airlines. Uh, <coughs> Elizabeth Short. One of the things that we've done as well on certain service request types is we generate a customer service letter. So over the last, uh, just over a year ago, we initiated this process. And if you request that graffiti be removed from property or if you request that the alley be baited because of a rodent problem, once that service request is closed out by the operational department, the system generates an, a letter to the constituent telling them that we hope that their service has been delivered in the manner in which they requested it and gives them the number of the 311 center or of their local alderman if they want to call back and either complain or follow up on uh, the request itself. Elizabeth? I'm interested in the impact of 311 that may go beyond improved services. I just finished reading Heat Wave about the 1995 deaths in Chicago and one of the things that seems to have come out of that is that it wasn't just an absence of services that resulted in this huge number of deaths, but a profound social isolation of the people that, that died. And I was wondering whether there's any way that you are able to use or the city is able to use the data you get from the 311 calls for making policy changes. We, that go we, beyond services. 
Yes, and we've done, and we've done a couple of things. Um, there are well-being checks that are conducted by our city's Department of Human Services and also by our Department of Aging and our Chicago Police Department's Community Affairs section in each police district. So databases of those callers, of the names of people that have been either requesting a, a well-being check or other assessments that they've requested by using the system throughout the years. And we now have about, I think, six million records on our, uh, on our service request database. Those are the, we, we now perform proactive outreach at times of heat waves or at times of uh, extreme cold weather in the winter time as well. Ed Dorn. Uh, in your narrative are some budget numbers suggesting that the uh, incremental cost of operating the system is about $16 million a year. But I take it that those are front end costs. Those, that is, those are associated with uh, the cost of, of answering the phone, the extra personnel there. But getting a service delivered is, getting a pothole fixed is more than simply a matter of answering the phone and knowing where the pothole is. Presumably, if it's going to be fixed faster, you need more folks in the trucks on the streets. I'm wondering whether or not there is a way of calculating the full cost effect of a system like this. I'm not objecting, by the way, to a system that costs more money in order to deliver more efficient services or faster services, but I'm wondering whether or not there's a, a way to compute what this is actually costing the city. Well, we, we can compute, oops, sorry. <laughs> We can compute some of the cost, some of the cost savings actually that it's done for the city besides the fact that you need more people to get things done faster. But we found out by using the system, some of it is the way that we were using people. Okay, so an example is like when we have lights out and we have a one out, a one out light out and we would send a crew out and if somebody called down the block on that same light, we'd send another crew out. We had multiple crews going out. So we now actually have built into the system duplicate checks. So we actually did save $6.9 million because we had 40,000 duplicates in the system for one year. So we had a cost savings in that because we no longer do duplicates. Duplicates, it's out there, there's only one crew for that. The other thing is, is what we had is for our water department. Our water department during our heat waves when Chicago is hot, we have a lot of water that people turn on the, the, um, the hydrants. They want to get cool, they turn on the hydrants. We were actually able to give the water department an analysis of what hydrants were actually getting open in the areas. They put caps on the hydrants and we were able to save two million gallons of water because of that. So some of it is cost saving, some of it is you need more crews to do things, but I think one of the things that we found out within the system is we're now tracking the resources, tracking the crews. So there's, there's not that um, multiple crews going out and doing things. So we're saving resources even though we're getting things done in a more efficient manner. Susan Golding. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly interested in, in, in the transparency of the system and how it can be used as a management tool, um, which, you know, in reading your report seems significant. Can you think of some examples or how, is it a citywide use that's going on now or, I mean, how is it being used? It's a citywide use of the system, and for every service request that we have, every type of service that we provide, we actually have, we have it monitored. The system actually monitors how many days it should take to resolve a request, how many, how many um, requests have been overdue, what crews. We can track down to the crew level. So, so we these, are, these are citizens' requests that come in through 311. What about requests that might come in through some other method, like going into an alderman or, or the mayor's That's, office? That's the unique thing that Chicago did. Anything that comes in through Anything. the alderman or the mayor's office is all entered in through three one through okay, the city so service request system. You do not have to call three one one. And the other thing is, is our departments are using it for their work order management That's system. Right. So actually, so for like our beat meetings and our neighborhood meetings, when we have people go out and represent the city, they're not only seeing the the issues that people have brought, but some of the things that we've done internally to make the neighborhoods better. So we're able to tell the citizens, here's what we've done for you. Nobody put this request in, we're actually doing this. We are being more proactive instead of reactive. So let me, if I can just a quick follow up. So if, if I were going out to speak to X neighborhood, I could very quickly answer, tell me whether this is true or not, 
find out everything that's going on in that neighborhood, who's doing it, how successful it was, et cetera, et cetera. And you, who initiated it as well. And so who initiated it. It, it that's, was that's initiated true. by the department itself through an aldermanic office, through a community policing office on the web by calling 311. 311 right now approximately enters uh, about 35% of the services that we're tracking. The other 65% get in through another portal. Also, based on, our, based on our system, actually if the water department needs to have things done by their Atlas grids, the electricity department needs electricity grids, other people do things by the police districts, other people do things by wards, each service request is defined for what geographical area they need. And the work orders go based upon the geographical area. We'll conclude with questions from David Osborne and Carl Weisbrot. My question relates to this issue of using the information to manage better sort of across the board. Um, one of the most intriguing sentences in your application to me was you said that this system uh, allows managers to establish customer service goals and oversee the work of their agency. I was curious, is that a policy of the city that agencies should have customer service goals or is that just something that a few managers do? No, that's, that's a function that's built right into the system so that every, every single service request of those 550 that Debbie mentioned, whether it's the report of a dead bird or whether it's the request for graffiti removal or the pothole being filled or the street light being turned back on, there's a set duration that's established. And once you go over that set duration, you're now, and that was one, of, and, and that, whole, that whole open overdue report that we produce was something that really helped our sewer department knock down the time. They began monitoring which, one, which, which requests for catch basins being cleaned were open and overdue and began assigning crews to make sure that they were knocking those numbers down. And uh, frankly, it doesn't hurt that the budget director receives the report from me every month telling him which departments have how many service requests open and how, uh, how many are overdue and uh, on average how many days they are overdue. Mm. Carl. Yeah, I, I have a sort of related question, which is uh, I, I certainly understand the front end of the system and how effective that is and, and, and how important that is and what a great job you've done with that. On the back end of it, um, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the criteria you use is the enhancement of city services. And you cite, for example, that graffiti response time has gone way down. Um, uh, I'm not quite clear how the system improves the productivity of, of actually making the end re response, or the substantive response. Is it that resources get shifted so that more crews are out doing graffiti, so that it's, it's more a resource allocation issue, or is it that the, the, the system itself provides improved productivity? Let me, let me use graffiti as an example for, uh, to answer your question, and that I'll let Debbie add on to this. One of the things that the Commissioner of Streets and Sanitation, that's the department that oversees graffiti removal, one of the challenges he faced was the manager of the, the uh, graffiti program uh, was saying, well, we need more graffiti blasters. It's a kind of a popular program in the city. They've got the soda blasters and it blasts the graffiti off of the bricks. And the manager kept saying, we need more of these, we need more of these, because people from around the city kept asking, why don't we get one of those graffiti blasters up in our neighborhood? Actually, when he analyzed the data, though, there was really less of a need for graffiti blasters and more of a need for graffiti painters, because a lot of the surfaces that the graffiti was being painted on couldn't be blasted off anyway. So by analyzing that data in that system, he was able to say, less money spent on blasters, more money spent on paint crews going out removing the graffiti. So he was able to make an informed choice about what he had to do. Mm -hmm. Well, <coughs> Ted O'Keefe and Debbie Cacavalli, we uh, want to thank both of you. We're, uh, it, it's impressive how much pride you take in your program. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.